So I think we'll get started. We got an extra minute. If any bell wonders in, that's fine. But uh, my name is Timothy Oliski, and um, welcome to my talk on DTrace. So this is my first talk at a conference period, but I am a huge FreeBSD enthusiast. I originally started using Linux years and years and years ago when I got hit with a configer worm. And I thought to myself, there's got to be a better way to do computers. So that kind of led me into Linux. And then Linux upgrades consistently broke my systems. And then I kind of landed on FreeBSD because it's more conservative design. That and the, the massive number of packages. I mostly use it in a, in a personal capacity. There have been some jobs where we've had large scale ZFS arrays, but um, I, I use it on my laptop. I use it on my servers. I use OpenBSD on my firewall. And it's, it, it works very solid. It's very reliable. My background is mostly in system administration uh, with some cybersecurity work in more recent years. And so let's talk, um, let's talk about why we're having this talk. So a couple of years ago, I had this idea. I was introduced to some security monitoring tools, but the tools are very expensive and they were very complicated. You know, things like a large elastic cell uh, cluster or like, you know, cloud-based seam tools. And I was thinking like, there's got to be a way to shrink this down. Like, I really, I really don't like that. If it's 50 VMs, to set up a security monitoring solution. That's not something that I'm going to do in my basement. That's that's just way too much complexity. And I was also using FreeBSD. I wasn't using Linux, I wasn't using Windows, I wasn't using a lot of these like enterprise sort of tools, but I, I kind of wanted some of these similar features. So my talk is kind of about if you're a system administrator and you want to get some meaningful alerts out of your FreeBSD box, then I'm hoping that this talk is something that will benefit you. So what are we going to talk about here? So we're going to talk about the basics of writing simple DTrace scripts to look for specific behaviors on your operating system. And, th and so this is kind of the workflow. We're going to talk about like finding malicious actions, executing them on your box, um, and then profiling them with DTrace, and then writing appropriate alerts, and then alerting on them later. And there's a lot of nuance to this. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of cloak and dagger stuff that kind of goes into this. You don't want to you don't want your uh, you don't want the person to know exactly where your defenses are sometimes. And also, the, your results are going to be different because your environment is going to be different. I'm mostly going to be talking about my laptop, but you can apply these principles to servers too. All right. So what this talk isn't, but we're going to touch on these things a little bit. We're not really going to be talking about patching, like, you know, software exploit mitigation mechanisms, uh, system hardening, identity access, responding or responding to security incidents, or even doing forensics. And a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in this talk can be covered by these other security mechanisms. But we're mostly just going to ignore those things just to focus on writing alerts. And uh, again, like what level of hardening you have depends on your environment, your system's configuration. You do need to patch. If you don't, you leave your systems vulnerable. Um, and yeah, my assumption for this talk is about running a FreeBSD server or laptop, and it's not about security. Pra it's not really about what your security practices should be or developing more and robust software. So ASLR is out of scope, Capsicum is out of scope, Pledge, Unveil, all out of scope. And all these things are important. A number of things can replace them, and but that's unfortunately that is just out of scope. <laughs> all right. So some of the assumptions that we're making about the security alerts is we're working against a live attacker. We're not working against strictly an automated process. And we're less in this environment. We're less worried about worms and botnets than we're worried about live attackers that are making decisions, assess the state of your security, and then use the techniques to bypass it. Attackers are going to use malware and automated processes, but their individual actions can be itemized and then reasoned about. If you're seeing security alerts, that means something is wrong. And doing that part and fixing that part effectively, doing something about that is kind of making the best of a bad situation. And you should you should already have good hardening. You should always have your basics fixed. If, if you just boot up a system for the first time. You don't bother installing a firewall. You don't bother patching. You just install a whole bunch of security monitoring alerts. It's, that, that's not really the right place to do that. 
And for example, do you want to have a security alert for SSH brute forcing, or do you just disable at, or do you just disable SSH password authentication? All right. So if you're not sure where to start with basic like security and hardening, check the handbook. And they've got all the information there to get to a reasonably secure system. You can go further and talk about like system hardening, and that's a that's a huge that's a huge topic, and there's lots of resources online for that. Um, we, we everybody talks about the CIA triad in computer security. You know the, the idea that you know your your computer system should disclose information accurately on time and only to the people who've been authorized. If you're using the PKG system, um, like known vulnerabilities, like PKG audit, PKG upgrade. Nine times out of ten, that'll fix a lot of the problems. If you're using custom software, that's uh, that's a big problem. I, I also can't account bad configurations of, as a vulnerability. And there are some tools in the ports collection, like Linus, that can help with auditing what looks like a bad configuration. They're not infallible, and they do have a lot of false positives, but it, it is a good place to start. Uh, also, make sure that you're checking like what ciphers your your servers are supporting. I think there's a lot more awareness of that now than there was, you know, 10 years ago, but it's still it still does matter. And then finally, make sure that like logs on your system are collected and put someplace useful. So I, I, I threw LNAV up on the board. It's a very, very simple console based log analysis tool. You just point LNAV at your directory and then it gives you a terminal display with all of your logs and you can apply various regexes to it. So it's a really, really helpful tool to go through all the logs on a system. And uh, you know maybe bonus points if you've got like read-only mounts for all your ZFS jails with all your loggings with all your logs, and then you just point LNAV at your read-only no mount FS jail like <clears throat> jail log partitions, and then you can view all the logs and all your jails in one terminal, and it's in ports, and it it works great. Uh, and I'm also mentioning that tool again because then yeah, that's not going to require a cloud-based tool. That's not going to require a whole bunch of compute resources. Okay, so so this is the system scenario that we're going to be using for this talk. It's not intended to be ideal, but it's something that's reasonable to configure. You've got, you know, you've got an eye towards security. You're not, you know, storing passwords in text files, but there and but there are some trade-offs, and you can't have everything. Um, so you've got your laptop. It's patched. It's up to date. You're using a password manager. You've configured like some sort of like some sort of bare access barrier to get you know to get to root. You're using su using su using sudo using duas. You have some sort of a firewall enabled. It's great if you're blocking known bad hosts just for you know just for spam just for like generic low level mal just for low level malware. And then you know additional DNS filtering for malicious hosts. Maybe you're using like AdGuard or like Unbound Local or something similar. And you do have a backup system. I, I do want to stress the backup system. I don't think we can ever stress that enough. I actually lost the SSD on my laptop last week. So the only reason this tack is still happening is because my backup routine saved me. All right. Now, this is something that's always been a big problem for me. It's like, okay, you got your system set up, you got your laptop set up, you got your hardware, you got your server set up. How do you know when something's actually wrong? This this has always been a tripping point for me. Like, okay, so you're doing your thing. Something bad happened. Something bad happens. You, you know, when when do you know? When do you find out? And I was I was playing around with Tripwire Samhain for a while. Like that that's a really fantastic solution. It just you know you get uh, like secure hashes of all your file system, all of your like objects in your file system. It gets exported to something else. You can compare it later. It's really time consuming to compute back. So if you're running this on a whole bunch of hosts across like on a large number on a large number of systems, if even if you're, even if you're just running it on like multiple jails, it takes a very very long time to get an actual file system to compare. Uh, ZFS snapshot diff monitoring, I think, is a fairly helpful way to do that. Just every single time you do a ZFS snapshot, just have a script that runs and says, "Well, here's my regex. If any of these like key files change, you know, maybe pop an alert for me." You know, so there's you know, there's a change to like an etc. Shadow. Uh, set for password, like any of your databases. If your SSHD configuration changes, maybe that's something that you want some sort of awareness on. And that and that's pretty simple, but that's only going to run when your snapshot happens. And then finally, log analysis. Yeah, you can totally write specific rules for your logs and your audits, but again, we're back into that trap of like, okay, you need this massive log collection system, and you need these like elaborate KQL rules, and it's it's very very complicated. 
And early in my career as a system admin, I'd occasionally find internet exposed systems with high CPU and network load. And oftentimes those would be running malware. And, and we never found out any of these systems until the damage was so severe that it was actually impacting other customers. I remember this one incident where, you know, the, like the firewall was just choking and there was some VM somewhere like deep in the cluster that was just using, that was just UDP like span, like UDP spanning. It was just, it was doing a DDoS attack to some IP in Romania. And the only reason we found out about it was because the firewall choked. It's like, well, it, it would have been helpful a lot earlier to know that was a problem there. And so this kind of gets us to the point, how do you know what to look for? So in recent years, there's been this sort of effort to have something called the MITRE framework. And the MITRE framework is essentially, it's Wikipedia for malicious actors and for the techniques that they use against operating systems. And it's, it's not perfect by any stretch, um, but, it's, but it's a pretty good starting point. The, one of the big problems with it is it only takes real world verified examples into consideration. So you need to have some, you need to have a lot of like reputation behind yourself before you can actually get into it. They're not gonna say, well, okay, Tim, you know, yes, it's true that you found this way to do key logging on a free BSD system, but we haven't actually seen this by a, by a real attacker, so we're not going to include this in the database. Um, and yeah, yeah, more popular systems do dominate the lists and bigger intrusions that dominate the headlines and have lots of professional forensic support are better represented. And that's, that, that's just the state of it. All right, but the framework itself is based around the idea that attacks have distinct stages. In order to do whatever the attacker wants to do on your system, he's going to have to run some sort of reconnaissance, figure out what you're running. He's going to have to get at, get some sort of access, find the objective, execute on it, and then you know maybe install a backdoor along the way, or maybe just disappear. So one of the arguments for this approach is that these attacking techniques take time and effort to develop. So blocking on them or alerting on them helps to disrupt an attack in progress. Because if you've spent you know, five years developing a really, really stealthy malware payload that uses, a really, that uses an unusual combination of syscalls, if you can see these syscalls in action as that malware is executing, you are aware to it and you can conceivably do something before your system is crypto locked or before your system or before your key data files have been stolen. In an ideal world, I know that we would have everything whitelisted, compartmentalized, but that's that's not the reality of what that's not the reality of what I see in a lot of systems. And again, if you want to follow the blog links or go have a little look at the MITRE technique, there's a lot of there's a lot of good stuff in there. And even if there isn't a lot of FreeBSD stuff, which we're going to talk about like right now, so um, it is very very focused on Windows workstations. It is very very focused on enterprise networks and large scale systems, it's, it's organizations, it's medium businesses with knocks. Those are the people, medium like large enterprise Fortune 500 companies that have knocks and dedicated security resources are the organizations that are gonna get the most value out of this. And yeah, there's no free BSD specific techniques. So on Monday, I did a quick search on the site for, for just, just, the, just the string free BSD. I got two results, uh, two pages. There was a cross-platform Trojan called Kobolos, and then there was a link to the Trojan on that's on the software summary page, and I think that that's it. That, that, that that's it. That's all you got. So we're kind of in an unfortunate position that we have to look at the general principles on how other operating systems are targeted and try to adopt those to FreeBSD. But uh, th this isn't really the end of the world. I mean, if you're using pseudo similar techniques, will apply to SU. Similar techniques will apply to Duas. If you're using XOR, yeah, most of the examples are going to be written for Linux, but a lot of those other examples are equally like applicable to FreeBSD or OpenBSD, depending. Your, your mileage will vary. It's, you will, you'll, you'll have to do the cross-compile thing. All right. Um, before we get a little bit too far, let's talk about what bad approaches are. So um, don't, don't try to make a list for, for everything. I, I've, I've, seen this, I've seen this a fair bit. The, the, the MITRE list is incomplete. You don't need, it's, it's not a checkbox. You don't need to go through like every single item and say, okay, we are covered for all the known existing techniques, we're good. Well, maybe, probably not. 
And it's incomplete anyway, because as before, they only let techniques in that are observed in real world situations. Uh, I, I do think this is done a lot because the metrics are easy. It's uh, it's things like, you know, oh, our team did really, really good this month because we went from 62% coverage to 65% coverage. And, you know, the metric is easy, so it, you know, it, feel, it feels productive. All right, and uh, let's talk about false positives for a second. False positives waste everybody's time. And especially, <laughs> it's, it's not just your time, it's everybody else's time. So test them before you start sending them to your notification system, and your on-call people will sleep better. And, but this is also for you. If you're woken up by your own alert at two in the morning and it's a false positive, you're, you're gonna be mad. So, so, so test aggressively your alerts before you actually push them into production. And, uh, and, and also uh, uh, keep in mind that security alerts are not a panchea. If this is done right, I feel that this moves your posture from a six out of 10 to a 6.5 out of 10. It'll give you the opportunity to respond, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to ignore everything else that's happening. Um, I, I like the net hack analogy. You know, you've got you, you know sense that there's a rogue going through your dungeon. You got to put you got to put monsters. You got to put traps in place to try to stop them. I've also seen the the minesweeper analogy used. You don't necessarily need a mine on every single tile. You just need enough trip wires that eventually that person, as they're running through their tag, is going to trip something, and then you can start to rewind, start to figure out, and then start to take actions. All right. So let's talk about our scenario here. So um, this scenario, oh, this is the scenario that we're going to use, that we're going to be exploring for the rest of the talk. There are a lot of other ways to do this. There are a lot of other techniques we could use. But this is, this is what we're going to, this is just what we're going to talk about. And I'm doing it this way because I want this to be mostly easy to understand. Um, this is based on the security posture that we like talked back on slide eight. You've got your workstation, you've got some like basic hardening done, you've got your packages installed you're using a key pass database, and you've got your you've got your like do as configuration discovered. So our scenario, we're gonna end up with uh, we're gonna we're gonna simulate the attacker running malware on the workstation, trying to steal the SSH keys key pass database. The attacker will install cron job SSH script. And, and the attacker will use those passwords to escalate to root and crypto lock the system. So I know that a lot of malware is actually it is not written in shell. It's, you know, you see a uh, ghost fantastic because it's cross platform. It's really easy. It's mostly easy to compile, but I'm using shell to try to make this easy to understand. Uh, it's a little bit harder when we go to talk about Dtrace though. It's, and as an aside, it's good to think about what an attacker would need to do to get root or to run a privilege escalate, or what they could accomplish on your systems with your permissions. And it's also good to think about what goals an attacker might have. Uh, ransomware is what we're going to use today, but there's you know crypto mining, there's data theft, and whether that's your email account credentials, whether that's your organization's you know product strategy plan, or maybe just maybe just they're, they're just trying to add your node to their botnet, or maybe they're, you know driven by ideology. And if you can get some help with this, if you've got a friend that you can trust, or if you've got somebody that can come do something to help you out with that, maybe that's a good idea. All right, anyways, uh, there's lots of ways, there's lots of initial access vector vectors. I mean, you know, bad passwords, you know, some sort of like, some sort of Trojan, I mean, the whole, the whole, like, the whole solar winds thing, you know, their supply chain got hacked, somebody inserted a mal somebody inserted malware down, like, you know, upstream, and then they reinstalled the new version, and it was from everything's backdoor. Um, but I'm, I'm being a little bit hand wavy here. So we're going to assume that something's already running on the laptop. I'm not going, I don't, I don't have, I don't have a, I don't have an exploit for an updated version of Chrome or Firefox. <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, for most of the testing, we use the Metasploit framework shell. And I'll get to that a little bit later. But uh, and I just, and I think this is like fairly good advice. Just beware of applications that ingest unverified data. You never know when like some library somewhere down the road is going to have a problem that could, you know, that could that could potentially give somebody a hook into your system. All right. So we start with initial access for being hand wavy. That's fine. The first thing the attacker is going to do is he's going to add a script to install a backdoor. So very, 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 very and, this, and this is kind of two steps. He's going to download a like run.sh file, put it in the local bin, and then he's going to add a script to the current tab. And the assumption here is that after, after the initial execution, the attacker will want to ensure that they can main connect to the laptop. And in, in this case, in this case, we're just going to use a cron tab. There's again, there's lots of other options, and this is a technique that is is referenced by the MITRE framework. So, this is just the contents of the backdoor script that I'm going to drop on the host. And 
essentially just creates some files in temp that make it kind of sort of vaguely look like an SSH agent. It then downloads the actual backdoor and executes it. And again, this is just to make sure the attacker has persistent access to this to whatever system he's running that initial Trojan on. Okay. So we're gonna like briefly talk about file transfer options. I'm using fetch for a lot of the like you know pull from the pull from the malware server into the host just because that's it's it's included in base, it's included in FreeBSD base and it's easy to use. Um but uh, and the same goes with NC. NC is a useful tool. I'm sure that a number of people have caught on to it for various reasons. It's very, it's a, it's really, really easy to grant, to transfer data back and forth, and it's in base. Um, it's it's also great for testing network connections. The NC like dash Z VVV is fantastic on a lot of hosts and jails. If I if I'm trying to diagnose a connection, and you know for whatever reason my web server can't see my database, I think it's firewall rule. Just you know NC. NC command, I can just verify that connectivity manually. And it's great because you don't necessarily have to install a more complicated tool to do that diagnostic work in one of your jails or VMs. Um, we are going to be using NC. More complicated Trojans do have better file transfer options. If you're actually running Meterpreter, if you're running something like Cobalt Strike, or you have a or you've got better, or you've got better like offensive tooling, that's something that's going to be covered. But just to keep this simple and like easy to recreate, we're just going to use NC. And this is the part of the scenario when the attackers landed on the box, he's installed the back door, he's looking for the key pass database, and then he's going to find it and he's going to exfiltrate it off the box. Okay. And then finally on to key logging. This is one of the ways that you can do key logging with somebody that's got with somebody that's running XOR. If you are running as a if you are running, if you are running a process that has the same like you know permissions as that user. If you pass in the display environment variables and the X authority environment variables to X input, then you get a then you get a dump of all the keystrokes that are happening. So, uh, from from X, from the man page, X input is a utility to list available input devices and query information about a device, and then change device input settings. Uh, normally, this is used to test keyboards, to test joypads, to test joysticks. Um, and you can also use it to remap keys, but it, it but it does have a mode called X test. Oh, sorry, test dash XI2, which registered input events and displays them. The dash dash root means that it does not open a window, which you don't want when you're running when you're running a remote shell. Um, and again, the caveats are on there. I just found a script on, I just found a really convenient script on Stack Exchange. The output that it generates is very verbose. It gives you like a big block of text for every key press for obviously diagnostic or debugging reasons. But there's a little Perl script that's linked into this that you, that'll just summarize it for you. So you just get a, like a little output of all the key presses, which is much more convenient. And uh, FYI, this does capture mouse input too, but we're, we're going to ignore that for today. Okay, so finally, getting root permissions. The attacker is assumed to download the key pass database, run the key logger, and then kill the key pass process. You can also just use the KeyPass uh, XC CLI tools if you're just if you have a, a shell session on the box. But uh, running interact running interactive programs in remote shells is uh, a good way to break your good way to break your connection. So uh, and let's talk about uh, okay. So got the database decrypted it, got the root permissions. Move on to the ransomware phase. So in the ransomware phase. They're going to destroy all of the snapshots for this particular for this particular section of the home operating system. So, want to destroy all of the snapshots for this ZFS file system, but not any of the data in it. And that just means the like at and then at and percent sign means just all the snapshots. And then the tack R is of course recursive. You could well, you could destroy all the snapshots, but it's probably it's going to take less time to destroy less. And then finally, here is the little crypto locker script that I wrote very, very quickly to kind of simulate this attack. Um, again, it's not a real ransomware script, but it's good enough to simulate the actions. I, I don't know if anybody else has written a crypto locker script with find. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> or not. <laughs> But anyways, uh, what, so what this does is this generates a key, it uploads the key to the attacker server, and it then finds all of the ODT, like, you know, the opened office documents in the home partition, 
and then encrypts them and then deletes the original. And then, of course, you know, drops the little message, you know, contact me at 555 to get your files back. All right. So quick action summary before we move on. And I'm still doing, yeah, I'm still doing okay on time here. So we got we got the shell session, whatever that, whatever that started as. We've got our fetch script on the back door. We've got we have the cron tab data, like steal the database, run the key logger, kill the key pass process, wait for the user to re-enter their password, escalate to root, remove the snapshots, run the crypto locking command. That's that's the scenario that we're going to talk about today. Right. Okay, so let's talk about dtrace. And you know, just ripped off of man dtrace. Uh, dtrace is a root kit. Dtrace has hooks in op in operating system calls that you can use to be you can use to examine the behavior of your operating system. It sees uh, not everything, but almost everything, and it answers a lot. It can answer a lot of questions about your behavior. I'm sure that most people in here have seen Dtrace being used for performance analysis or for like examining why a program doesn't behave properly or why there's an issue or why there's a problem with it. All right. So why are we using Dtrace for this? Because it has a lot of probes, it has a lot of hooks into the various levels of the operating system that gives us a lot of visibility. And the other point with the very little system impact is also important, like relatively low resource usage and very low risk of damage to your system. If you're trying to write something that's monitoring kernel behavior and you're loading a kernel module, that's that's very that's very risky, very dangerous, very bug prone behavior. That's not something that I want to write because I will crash my system in the process of developing that kernel module. So this is mature, this works great. Uh, this does still need root permissions and, and it does need a loaded kernel module. So be careful, again, like with any program that you're running with root, uh, you know, be careful with the permissions, be careful who you're giving that to, be careful how you're running things. Uh, I, I strongly encourage you to learn more about Dtrace. Uh, there's links, there's links just behind me. Um, yeah, yeah, start with the man pages, the one-liners, and then like start start writing your own scripts. And the FreeBSD system calls are well documented, and you can just use you can just use the man page.
that the if, if you run that probe the way it is, you will get a whole bunch of invalid errors because the first argument, the first argument is an integer type, and the second argument is the path. So if you want to run, if you want to trace like opens with file names and processes, and you're using the open AT system call and not the open and not the open system call, you need to use the R1, not the R0, as in the example. Uh, this, this was something that tripped me up when I started to go through examples. I should, pro I should probably send those as an email. All right. All right. So from our tax scenario, let's talk about let's talk about the methodology. Uh, the, we need to figure out which probes that we actually need to write the alert. So the dtrace that's printed up on the screen executes a program and then records a summary of all the syscalls that the program uses, which is a pretty good starting point for the detailing the behavior of this program. And uh, like, and again, be careful because this is run with root permissions. Uh, and sometimes you can guess which which probes you need. Like if something is writing, if something is consistently writing to a specific file location or needs to do a specific action, like you know, kill a process. Like nine times out of ten, it's like, well, if you're killing a process in the operating system, it's you know, there's that there's a specific call that's done to the operating system to kill another process, right? That's you don't necessarily have to profile it to be able to figure that out. So sometimes you just know. Anyways, this is the output of the last program just running the fetch command. So you can and then placing it in the user's you know, dot local bin directory. And you can see all the probes that were triggered and then how many times each of them were triggered. So you can start to see like, okay, so if we want to monitor for this behavior, these are the syscalls being called. Uh, you will need to have an understanding of what the syscall means and how the operating system uses it. But again, that's really well documented. And the safest way to check it is just man space to space name of the syscall. So from there, the next program, uh, like trace syscall profile, uh, trace underscore syscall.d profile, the open syscall, it profiles the open syscalls of the target application and prints the paths of the files that the program opens and displays the flag as an integer type. So in the C programming language, when you open a, or actually on FreeBSD, when you open a file, you pass a flag to the open command to let the operating system know, are you opening this file for reading only? Are you opening it for executing? Are you opening it for writing? That flag, uh, that flag can be returned uh, when you're running this dtrace probe. So, and you can see that summarized at the, at the very bottom. So we can see that the fetch command opens four files, but the file final is the only one that we care about. And, and the open flag matters too, because it, it helps, it help, it'll help tune down the alert. All right, and this is finally the prototype alert. So what we're alerting on in this particular example is we're looking for a syscall that starts with this absolute path and has a file creation flag set. So when the syscall is when the syscall is entered and those conditions are valid, it will print an alert with the full path of the variables. And, and there's a bunch of issues and there's a bunch of blind spots with this alert that we can kind of circle back to later, but that's the that's the basic methodology. We profile with whatever program that we're worried about. We look for how it's used, like what kind of syscalls it's using and how it's doing it. And then we write dtrace programs to print alerts based on those discovered behaviors. All right. So uh, before we go further, we need to talk about what constitutes a good alert. And this this is very much my personal opinion, but alerts should be alerts as in pay attention and do something. This is not, this isn't about, you know, oh, this is something you might want to be aware of, or, you know, if you've got a couple of minutes, then, you know, maybe, you know, you should do something. This is important. This is important. So sit up and pay attention. It should be very specific. A generic key logging alert is less useful than an NX input key logging alert. And I, again, uh, try to link to the MITRE framework for narrative purposes. It matters a little bit less if it's on your workstation, but if it's a lot of people, then it gives you that common lexicon to go back and forth. And the same thing goes with documentation. If there's any next steps, if there's any things that a forensic analyst might need, or if there's anything else that you need to know about an alert, that, that should be written and recorded somewhere. And then finally, sometimes odd behaviors or actions are good candidates. So if root runs, who am I? Well, I, how, often, how often does that happen in your environment? Or does that happen right after somebody runs privilege escalate and they're just you know, double checking that it actually worked? Or maybe something logging into an SSH program and an automatically and invoking a program that isn't on there. So sometimes you get those, sometimes there's those little behaviors that are unusual enough that that can constitute a good alert. All right. 
So let's talk about creating alerts for the, let's talk about, let's talk about creating alerts for the techniques that we just discussed. And this is the part where we combine D-trace with our scenario from earlier. And uh, just mandatory word of warning, uh, these are proof of concept, <laughs> these are mine. If this doesn't work for you exactly the way I expect, please don't be angry with me. Use your own, use your own ju best judgment. Again, this, this talk is way more about methodology than here's a list of probes that you can just, here's a list of deep programs that you can just install in your operating system and then you've got really, and now you've got really, really good visibility. All right. So I, I know that I was a little bit hand wavy about the initial execution, but looking for executions from programs that shouldn't do it is kind of a good idea, or it might be a good idea. I, I don't know. It depends what programs are running on your box. Test it first. Uh, the first one, it, this might look a little bit counterintuitive, but th it's looking for the for Firefox using the exec system call. If Firefox uses the exec system call, then it will print an alert. And there are some possible improvements with that up there. You know, you might want to extend this to other programs. Like if your PDF reader like spawns a new process, maybe that's something to be aware of. And then talking about, all right, so here's the next script for shell being added to local bin. And this is, this is a little bit more refined. Uh, it's, it would be better to include like the open, like the open syscall, but also the open AT system call, depending on like fetch uses open, but various other programs use open AT. And as Capscom becomes more prevalent, I think more are going to use open AT and that just use the default file path. Um, this one's also kind of useful if you're worried about other locations. So if you're worried about, you know, like PHP files being written to, you know, user local www nextcloud. This is some. This is a this is a conceivable approach that you could use to look to alert yourself to web shells within your within your server environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's see, arg, yeah, arg one is the file as the flag of the file created. Other flags would help the coverage. And again, you can double check the man pages for more information. Uh, there are again, there are some caveats with this alert. Uh, files being dropped elsewhere, having a relative path, won't trigger this. And then, and this also won't trigger if the file is copied into the directory from another directory because that's a that's a different behavior. But again, like coverage isn't perfect. Like alerts have faults. Just if you're aware of them, that's that's a good thing to be, or a good thing to have. All right. So watching for cron tab execution for a specific user. So what this is looking for is if this user runs the cron tab dash command or the cron tab dash e command, then fire an alert that user Tim did a cron use use cron tab. And, and yeah, back to the system hardening, you could totally you know disallow certain users from using cron tab. Maybe that's useful. But if it's just you and your laptop and you're just working through your day and you see an alert pop up that your cron tab was changed, well, okay, well may, maybe I'm a little bit more suspicious now. Uh, it doesn't crowd, and again, this doesn't cover all cron tab invocations. It just covers like standard in and, and edit. All right, and uh, uploading so uploading the key pass database. So this alert prints out the name of the program that isn't keypass XC and touches any of the four paths that might be the like keypass XC database file. So um, I, I don't think there's much I can talk about. This this one's not great either. If there's any other file on the system that is passwords.keydbx and it's opened with any other program, you're going to get an alert. But uh, it's better better than nothing. And then our scenario for running the keylogger. If X input is executed with these arguments, then run the alert. The exact name path, path uh, predicate is probably not needed. But if you see this being opened, key logging is happening. And then for running key pass, uh, just proc signal send looking for like key pass XC. If a, pro, if, if a signal is sent to that process, then you will pop an alert. Uh, it's not particular about the signal. It could probably be refined a little bit more to look for specific, like to look for specific signals. And uh, surprisingly, it surprised me anyway that if you kill, if you kill this, or if you kill all the key pass XC pros, like if you just use the PID versus the name, you'll still the alert will still trigger. Which I, I was, I was pretty, I thought that was pretty neat. Okay, and ZFS snapshots again. This is the same kind of thing. If you're using if there's, an, if there's a recursive ZFS destroy invocation on the system, then print an alert. And maybe you want to expand the coverage to cover all deletion, but 
Uh, if you're running something like ZRAP or if you've got some sort of snapshot management program in place, that's going to trigger a lot of alerts. So maybe you don't want to do that, but any sort of recursive option is probably not a bad idea. Yeah, five minutes. No, is there an is there a reasonable interception you'd want to perform when you're suffering something rather catastrophic like a recursive deletion of your snapshot? Uh, if you can kill the process in time, that's great. But um, network isolation might be good. It depends on the malware you're up against. I mean, is this a process that is going to attempt over and over and over again to delete it, and now you're in this cat and mouse game? Or is this, you know, somebody's sent a shell command to your box and said, okay, now we're going to kill the pro, we're going to do this, and now if you cut the network access, you can't send that command anymore. So it, it, it depends. Uh, I, I wish I could talk more about, like, response in this, but this is, response is very complicated. Um, all right, okay, and finally, the crypto lock command. This isn't a, a fantastic alert, but essentially, if open SSL is executed and a new file is written, then print an alert. And I've added the parent process to the ID because if you see about if you see a couple of these in rapid sequence, maybe you want to kill that parent process. All right, so let's quickly talk about the summary. Uh, one second. Um yep. Is E-Trace capable of doing something on those matches like R1 is 15 for itself? Uh, is there also a matching on uh, day of uh, time of day or so? Like yes, there are. Run shops uh, at 3 a.m. is untypical behavior. Yes, absolutely. You can have timestamps. You can have date ranges. There's a there's a lot of extra variables that D-Trace can provide. Yeah, because that's. Um, Open SSL could be run over the day. It shouldn't be run in not at the night times. Open SSL is running a lot of is running a lot of different processes. It's it's even run. Uh, I, when I was profiling this alert, I was running my music. I, I use a program called Music on Console for FreeBSD, and that you that opens that opens cryptographic libraries. I was like, whoa, okay, all right. well, but it but it makes sense. Like if you're like if you're decoding if you're decoding music files, that you probably use some crypto functions, right? Yeah. Yes, there are further. Okay, all right. Um, then finally, all right. So summary. So we define the attack. The attack methods start to finish. We analyzed each step of it, and then we wrote simplers to notify us of any of the techniques we're using each step. And the methodology going forward is to examine the MITRE framework. You pick techniques that are that are likely to work in your system that you can't cover with hardening or with the changes to the environment, and then you define alerts for those specific scenarios. For the proofs of concepts, you can actually execute the attack in a controlled environment and see which attacks work. And the next time you're doing a pen test, if you can pick up on what the testers are doing, then you can pat yourself on the back. Uh, it, it, it can sometimes be worth keeping your alert secret, sometimes not. Like you, you should, if if you get hacked or if you get compromised, it's worth sharing the details with what ha with what happened and how it happened, because that gives other people in the community and in the world the ability to say, okay, we need to be on the lookout for these actors using these techniques. And that, that might save somebody else's bacon. But keeping your exact alerts a secret can be helpful. This is kind of a cloak and dagger stuff, but you don't necessarily want the attacker to know like what your defenses are. So maybe you don't publish those in a public GitHub, but it's still, or, or maybe you do share it. Maybe that, maybe that helps. I mean, antivirus share their products freely, right? Okay. And just at the end of the talk here, I do have some little additional processes and hacks that might help you if you decide that you want to, if you want to go down this path. The first one is you can run DTrace as a daemon. I wrote a very, very quick RC script that, uh, <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> yeah uh, DTrace alerting daemon is, is the abbreviation. I thought it was, I thought it was cute. But yeah, just it'll run the probes, it'll push it to a log file. <laughs> And it'll just run in the background, and you'll just end up a log. And then you can add that log to whatever you want. And then finally, notifications with Herb. So Herb is a very, very simple, like daemonless notification system that works without Dbus. So just throw. So if it's just on your laptop and you just want to display alerts on your desktop fairly easily, and you're not, you know, pushing things to like some sort of a cloud notification or push notification service, just put like the following line. Just like PKG install Herb, and then put the following line into your X and RC. You kind of need the middle said line because Herb expects one argument per line. So if you have like alert, space, 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 you get like, you know, you'll get like four lines down. But yeah, just 
pipe the log file into Herb, and then when it buffers, it'll start the program, and then you'll get alerts. All right. And some tools that I used on this, uh, I definitely use the Metasploit framework to test some of these techniques. It's helpful to emulate. It's helpful to emulate sort of that limited shell that you're gonna that an attacker would end up with on, on a lot of these systems. So uh, using, if you want to test these yourself, I use the following payloads. Uh, the Meterpreter, like versus TCP in Python, is, is pretty good. But I did a lot of the testing just with the base BSD, like you know x64 shell versus TCP. For a lot of like serving payloads, it, it's helpful to have a web server. But if it's just a little bit of local testing, just use the Python module to serve whatever like payloads or files you need in a in a small environment. And uh, just like a closing note about Atomic Red Team, if you're not sure about how to write the techniques, or if you need a little bit of help to start with it, um, there is the Atomic Red Team GitHub. So there, this is a huge pile of YAML files that are linked back to the MITRE technique that have like, written shell commands, or they will download and run malicious programs. So you don't have to necessarily reinvent the wheel. Uh, so MITRE is fairly high level, and it's more of a policy or methodology tool. Atomic Red Team will actually have all the techniques. There is also an automated tool for testing those techniques on your box from Atomic Red Team, but it's written in PowerShell, so it's not super duper useful on FreeBSD. Now, that being said, all the data is in well-structured, compliant YAML files, so it probably wouldn't take too much for somebody to write a very simple Python script to examine the YAML file and then execute a technique across the network. Uh, that, that doesn't sound like that doesn't sound like something hard, so it'll probably take me four months. All right, and let's see here. What else I got? Um, yeah, automated tool uh, it, for for testing would be nice. I think one of my next project might be to have some sort of like an automated agent in one jail, and then a preset list of techniques in another jail, and then as you execute the technique, see which attack, see which alerts are getting triggered. So you can kind of so you can kind of continuously verify that you know your security system is working as in as as it triggered you know kind of like kind of like unit testing these sorts of things if that if that was your thing. Oh, and I actually have a demo video. I was going to do this in real time, but it took me like an hour to actually do this. So uh, what we've got going on here is in the upper left. That's the Metasploit I'm going to be running the commands. The steps are documented down here, and then. On this side, on the top, I'm running the shell. The middle one isn't really being used for anything. Uh, this one is the netcat listener for the passwords when that gets uploaded. And then there is the HTTP server, which serves the payload. And you'll see the alerts in the upper right-hand corner of the screen as the techniques are executed. Okay. All right. So I do have, uh, I think I have a couple minutes to take questions. It is currently 11.03. So I don't know how quickly we have to clear out. But if anybody has like, questions, comments, concerns, no, all good. I have a question. Yes. Uh, are there any uh, specific reasons not to use the pull gates? And previously to capture the absolutely not. If you can use audit and audit works for you, you should absolutely use that. I just I use I like, I like using dtrace because I find it a little bit easier to reason about. I'm interested in the uh, overhead um, 
difference in the overhead heat, heat rates and uh, so security audit system to capture the uh, system call with uh, so execution of the file with the arguments. You mm -hmm. are picking up the contents of the arguments. Yeah. I see the D trace script, but I I guess the D trace version is a uh, bit heavy compared to the uh, CPU. So unfortunately, I have not benchmarked any of this in a production environment, so I do not have an authoritative answer as to what the overhead is and how big a D-trace file do you have to run before there's an before there's an adverse system response. Thank you. Sorry, sorry. Right. Uh, does anybody else have any questions, comments, concerns? Nope. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for my for coming to my talk and you know supporting me and uh, thank you again to all of the awesome developers that have like produced FreeBSD that have produced all the tools and to the community that have made this all possible.